Hey, well, everyone, uh, good evening. Thank you very much for coming out to this talk. Um, talk, just as you heard, is exploiting volatile memory analysis challenges for fun and profit. And so the whole purpose of this talk is to see there are multiple inefficiencies. If anyone has ever done uh, memory analysis before, it's a tedious process. However, there are tools that should exist to help us optimize the process to be faster. And so that's the whole reason that this tool has been developed. Um, just as a show of hands, before we get straight into the slides and things that we're going to cover. Um, who has ever done memory analysis before? If I can just see. OK, all right, very good. So it's, it's kind of like a good half and half, so perfect. Um, so at least I, I believe this talk will be useful because you can really understand the, the issues with conducting this type of analysis. And then hopefully, uh, we have a new product that has been created to help optimize that process. OK, so here are some things to expect in our talk today. Um, the most important thing and the unfortunate thing is this one. So I always have the live demonstration gremlin. And that's because like, whenever we come up, we have a tool. We have something that we want to talk about. It usually works on our side. Backstage, I tested everything. But sometimes, as soon as you get on stage to do a presentation, something crashes. Um, so hopefully, that does not happen. But if it does, I apologize. I'll do my best to fix it. Uh, and then, uh, also, just a quick disclaimer. Uh, the views that are presented here, in essence, is just it's on behalf of myself. It does not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Defense, the US Air Force, or the US government. All right, Just everything is me. Okay, so here are some references um, from the talk and from this research um, that we're going over. All of these books were consulted in the creation of this tool, as well as the additional features that are built inside the tool itself. Um, on the bottom side here, in case you ever see that question mark and some text in here, um, that's where I'm placing a specific reference to one of the books that we mentioned. And so this is a, a talk. It's a condensed talk over like a week-long workshop that we have that we go over. So at least we can get the like the, the summary, the, the, the good juicy bits, and then everything else, if you, if you want more slides and more details, just feel free to contact me, and I'll be sure to get that information out to you. Okay. So just real quick, uh, who am I? Um, I? I just transitioned from the director of uh, being cyber operations training, so that was a great position to be able to train. How do you do cyber operations for a very, very large organization? Uh, before that, I was an assistant professor of computer science at the uh, US Air Force Academy, um, as well as a research scholar at the University of Southern California. So I love research. I love teaching. That's kind of been a, a, a huge, um, like just a, a desire and, and a passion of mine um, to be able to help others. And then before that, uh, those positions, I was director of intrusion response um, for the Air Force Computer Emergency Response Team, and uh, also a security operations center uh, manager. Then before those positions, I was a software reverse engineer. I got to reverse engineer some pretty, um, pretty exciting software. I also continue to teach courses on software reverse engineering to this day, and then software development. And at the bottom, just some uh, education. OK, um, so the research motivation, like again, I, I kind of said some of the things previously, but why are we really focusing on this? Well, the first thing to understand, um, like it was great that we had a, a really nice talk about um, from Jason E Street, um, when you can see that, look, we can, we can create malware that continues to exist and it continues to exploit machines. There is an issue with the way that we do uh, security as well as exploitation. Exploitation is it's, it's difficult, but it always seems if we know a few steps, then we can always uh, be a step ahead of the people who are defending the network. And so as a case in point, there was a research study a few years ago by uh, the, RAND, uh, the RAND organization. And they said from the malware that they looked at, the average lifespan of malware on, on a system, a protected system, was about seven years. Seven years on some of the zero-day malware that they saw out there. So that's a long time. Something to understand is like there's a, there's a, a, a cross-reference of what our antivirus vendors are telling us exist, and then what is the true reality. Antivirus vendors will tell you, hey, we stop all the malware. We do all these things uh, really fast, really fast. Yeah, very good, except there are still issues. A real study was able to show that like seven years some malware can exist, multiple years on a, a protected environment. There is an issue, and we need to be better at how do we uh, conduct and execute defense. Uh, something else that I always say is malware that is advanced to evade the host system, even evade the operating system that it's working on, as well as network um, traffic in order to like hide and, and appear to be as benign and legitimate as possible. But one place malware cannot hide is in memory, volatile memory. Every system, every 
process or daemon that executes, there are always traces that are left behind. And so uh, when I talk about the Locard's principle of forensics, it's a founding principle that says, look, no matter what, there's always something left behind, and if we know what to look for, if we know how to analyze or investigate, we should be able to find these artifacts and then to be able to find, like, determine whatever is going on um, on the system or inside an organization in general. And then the Xavier construct, I created that construct um, in order to automate and enhance memory analysis for uh, everybody else. I especially remember, this was a few years ago that, you know, I, I like watching talks, I like watching other individuals who are experts in the field, and I saw one person that um, was really, really good about malware analysis, memory analysis. He's up at a talk at a really well-known um, conference like this one, and he's like, all right, let's talk about how do we do memory analysis, it's gonna be really advanced, really advanced stuff. I'm like, all right, great, hey, let, let's see what's, go what's going to happen. And then he pulls out a terminal, and he goes back into volatility. And now he's sifting through things line by line. I'm like, yes, that is good analysis, but there should be better tools to help us move along instead of spending our time on the command on, or on the terminal executing commands. So which type of memory analysis artifacts exist out there? And so these are just a few. I put a few of the juicy ones that I like to determine, like, hey, what can we actually extract from that volatile memory? Some of the things to the left side here, um, details and uh, in information about processes, um, unpacked, binary, services, drivers, DLLs, all of these things are still present in memory if we know how to investigate, if we know how to um, bring it down. Now we can find other traces of malware. I like how um, there's a reference of unpacked binaries in case anyone has ever done reverse engineering or uh, even just malware analysis. Um, your average to more advanced software or malware out there, it's going to be packed. It's going to be encrypted. It is very difficult, a priori, to have a malware sample if it's packed and then to be able to say, well, here's everything that it does, because all of my normal tools are going to be defeated if I'm trying to analyze this statically, except for certain types of packing and encryption routines that the malware sample may use, you may only have to wait for a little bit. Wait to allow it to execute, because any time any type that you have a packed sample, you have a stub and then the actual egg inside that packed sample. So wait for the stub to finish. Unpack it, the actual malware. It's going to now be present in memory, especially if you know what to look for. If we talk of the malware analysis process, I'm looking for like the last jump statement in which the packer is unpacking itself, it's loading the actual egg into memory, and then it executes a jump to say, hey, go and execute this process that, is, that I've already loaded for you. So with us doing the memory analysis part, if we can just wait for that stuff to execute, wait for it to finish, now I can dump the most likely unpacked sample, and then I can continue my analysis from that point. But that's a good, um, that's a good example of uh, some of the details and artifacts that we can extract from memory. There are many other details and artifacts that are also present in memory to include uh, descriptor tables, the clipboard, anything that you're copying and pasting, all of that's going to be present in memory, and it stays in memory unless it's overwritten. Other things that I really love, so if we talk about forensics, I love seeing the master file table as well as the prefetch. So the master file table, this tells you it's, an, it's like a journal or an archive of every file that exists on the operating system. Every file that was there the last time it was accessed, the first time it was created. Normally you would think that only it's only present on the hard drive, but actually the Windows operating system loads that into memory. And so if we know what to look for, we can extract that master file table and now begin our analysis as well to see if something nefarious did occur, when did it occur, what are some of the malicious files that we need to go after and we need to find. Another artifact I do like seeing is the prefetch. So the system uh, prefetch, you know, it's a good, it's a, it's a cache that allows processes to run faster the next time it's, it's executed on the host system. But we can use this as a forensics piece to see, okay, what actually existed on the operating system, the Windows operating system, and at what time. It's great to be able to download this and pull this um, from the memory itself. There are many other artifacts here that we can extract, um, but uh, we'll see some of these as soon as we get started into the demo. Um, so just real quick, uh, I want to talk about uh, the malware or the memory acquisition tools of the trade. There are two main types of analysis that we'll do on volatile memory. Um, we have online and offline type of analysis. In short, if we say it's online, it just means the system was on, it was active. These are ways that we can dump the, me the memory and then conduct analysis. But what happens if the system is off? Well, there's still offline analysis that we can execute as well. And we just have to look at different files or different um, features in order to execute our offline memory analysis. 
Right? And I'm kind of skipping over these because at least, you know, the, like the, the basics of memory, like how do you acquire and, and analyze, like that's, that's it's not too hard. You know, I just want to make sure everyone were all at the same foundations in order to, to move forward. Uh, online tools of the trade, there are many good tools that exist out there. If you just Google how do I acquire memory, you'll see lots of tools that, that you can actually use to now dump the memory and then analyze the memory. I put the tools that work best for me um, to include Magnet RAM Capture. These are uh, free tools as well. Uh, Magnet RAM Capture, that one works. It has worked perfectly. Um, it's only failed just a few times. Um, next, Dump It or Fire Eyes, uh, Memorize, WinP WinPMEM, et cetera. So all you, all you have to do is here, if you are interested in this and you haven't done it before, you can Google these, you can download it, you can search on YouTube, how do we make this work, how do we execute it? And then you'll see all of the tutorials of which other people have done before, so now you can grab uh, a, an image of memory and then begin your analysis. Right. And then there are also honorable mentions. I listed even more tools, not the main ones that I use, because other tools exist that also conduct that memory dump, but sometimes they have failed on me, especially when I needed it most. So that's why I said, ah, I'm going to move these to the honorable mentions, since the ones up here are the more tried and true um, procedures that work for me almost every time. With the tools, um, just a few things to note. One, or the second thing to note, is that um, every tool, each tool has its pros and cons. The one that you are most comfortable with, or you know, they may work on certain machines or not work on others. It, it all depends on what you like and how you're most comfortable in executing these tools. Yeah, and then the last one, you can also analyze directly uh, VMEM. And so if you are um, conducting an analysis without even having to do like a, a massive dump and then convert, you can just convert a, uh, a VMware workstation image into an, an, uh, like a, a different format that will now allow some of our tools to analyze it even faster. All right, uh, so here are just three other uh, ways or things to include when we talk about offline analysis. In general, I prefer not to do offline analysis if I can avoid it, um, because they, you know, it's temporal. Like I've lost a lot of data if the system is offline, but there may, may still be significant artifacts that you can extract. One of them would be the hibernation file. That's a compressed version of whenever on a Windows machine, if you've ever had that blue screen of death, and you're like, oh, crap, my Windows system has halted at this point. But yet you see some numbers ticking across the screen. It's, it's incrementing. What is that? Well, that's actually your memory that's being uh, converted and stored up to your, onto your hard drive in case you want to come back and do some debugging on that system. So in case that ever happened, like let's say from a malware infection or from a poorly configured ransomware type of attack, if you can grab that memory as the system just did as blue screen, you may be able to analyze that. And you could also find additional features or determine what happened up until the crash. Uh, crash dump file, very similar in case a, a file did um, crash. We can use a tool from Kome that I included on the previous slide to convert that crash dump into an, an anal a image that we can analyze and then continue your, your investigation. Or the page file. I say the, pay the page file, that's your, your uh, last, last, absolute last resort. Um, because the page file, is there is nothing really contiguous in the page file. It's just in case your memory, like your system ran, ran out of RAM. There's no more memory present. Then some artifacts may be saved to the page file. You might be lucky if you start to do like a grep or a search through the page file, but um, I try and avoid analysis through the page file as much as possible. Okay. With all of that said, at least we've, we've done the background. Now let's get into an actual example, and then let's see how would we do that in the old way, and then how do we do it now with the new tool um, that has been released, as well as a fresh new uh, update on GitHub as of maybe 12 hours ago. OK, um, so I want to introduce you to Memlabs. And so Memlabs, this is a, a suite or it's multiple memory challenges that's um, been created by um, his, his uh, handle is Stuxnet999. And you can find these on, um, on um, GitHub. So the whole purpose of these mem labs, there are six different challenges that goes through practice your ability to conduct memory analysis. Then if you look at some of these, you can see, OK, how would I carry out or how would I you know, accomplish this challenge? And you can also Google to see who, um, any other individual who's done specific write-ups on how do you accomplish those challenges. Then you can figure out, oh, OK, I missed something. Like, here's a process. Here's a way that I, can, I could have done this better. That's kind of the whole purpose of the Memlabs. I really like it because it's a good, it's a good um, 
series of images that we can use for educational purposes. How would you conduct analysis? How can we learn? How can we get better? That's why I've included this, um, this link up here as well, directly how to download these uh, memory labs. Now, for us, for this uh, example, uh, we'll get started with MemLabs uh, part one. And so here's the challenge problem. Excuse me. Uh oh, sorry, did I go back? Yeah, OK, so here's the challenge problem. So in essence, your colleague's sister's computer just crashed. Uh, we were fortunate to recover um, her memory jump. Your job is to get the important files from the system, also to help determine like, what happened during this investigation. While she was still using the machine, um, she noticed that a black command shell or a black you know, um, terminal popped up. There was text writing on the screen, and then everything shut down, and then she wasn't able to use her computer anymore. Now, we've been able to grab a crash of her system image. We've converted that to a normal image that you can do analysis. And so your task is to determine what happened, what files are useful or unique onto the system, and then what can we learn from exactly what, what occurred. So if we want to move into the memory analysis, there are tools that we can use, tried and true. The tool, if anyone's done this this, any type of memory analysis, you know, we are comfortable with some of these tools that are listed up there. Recall is a very good one. It's very similar to the volatility um, framework. There is Vandiant's FireEye Redline. That's really nice. It's a user interface on uh, memory analysis. Uh, the SAN SIFT framework, that's another one that you can use to conduct uh, memory analysis. And then FTK Imager. Um, these, these tools are free, so if you have something like FTK Imager, you can dump your memory, and then you can also analyze it. Now, the tool I like most is Volatility, and so it's a good tried and true. It's well updated. Every year, at least for the, a few years ago, there were challenges on plugins. How do you extend this and make this even better? That's the tool that I like doing, um, that, I, that I like using. So here. I'm just saying like, there are benefits and disadvantages with the volatility tool. Um, it's command line. If you like command line, awesome. If you don't like command line, well, let's choose another tool that's a user interface. But it's free. I really like it, so let's, let's dive into it. Um, some of the things that we want to look at in this specific investigation, um, so that would include like, which processes, what are the call trees, command line arguments, um, parent, sibling, and offspring relationship between processes, network activity, DLLs, where are the imports, uh, import tables, import capabilities. Um, on certs in one of these processes that are running on the system. Um, file, files itself, like handles, uh, prefetch, timeline, the master file table. What can we determine about the, the hard drive itself and what files existed, what could have changed, what are relevant in this type of investigation? And then data carving, to be able to dump information from that memory. And so if it's present, there are many times that we can dump the process, we can dump the process memory to determine like additional artifacts of what's going on. Now, uh, if, if you've done this before, and I, I saw like we're about half and half of people who have done this uh, type of memory analysis before, let's say if we've, if we've done this analysis with volatility, there are good things about it, but let's, let's go with one of the bad things. And if you've done volatility before a real investigation, you will understand this. And so you will see that if we want to uh, execute any function on the machine, um, so myself, I'm, I'm quite verbose whenever I'm in, uh, conducting an investigation like this. And so I save off, I execute every plugin, which is a specific feature from the volatility tool, and then I write it into certain files. But after you do this a while, you have lots of files that you have to go through and lots of things that you have to analyze. Has anyone else felt this pain before, or am I the only one? Right? Like, you know, it's, it's, it's cumbersome to have to go through these, but there is a better way of doing this, and that's exactly what we're going to dive into. So my man, Albert Einstein, one of the, the quotes that, that he mentioned is, you know, everything that you do, it should be made as simple as possible, not just simpler. And so in this tool, I try to make it as simple as possible. So in essence, this is kind of what the construct looks like, in which you have the system itself, and then there are specific attributes or um, things that we do want to look at, and then it will expand as we gain additional information from the system. So I think that's about it. Uh, OK, almost, almost. There, there are a few, more, a few more slides. I don't know how am I doing on time. I don't know if I need a rush or so. OK, all right. Uh, I, do I have 20 minutes left? My man, do I have 20? I think so. 20 minutes left? OK. Oh, everything I need? All right, I'll take a couple of hours. All right, we're all good. Just get comfortable. Uh, no, so let, let's talk about um, aggregate plugins. So at least when we saw in a, a few of the previous slides, like when we talk about this, 
Yes, yeah, when we talk about this um, information, a lot of this stuff, a lot of this data, it's, it's, it's redundant. And so that's why if we can aggregate the multiple plugins into a single interface, I believe that that makes it easier for all of us to conduct our investigation. So that's um, what I mean by plugin aggregation. And so, yep, let's, let's see what that looks like. So if we go from the operating system, we can think of it as a stack that we move upwards. And so if we look at our data conversion process, we start here with the physical memory. Whatever is the memory that's running on the system, we now execute our acquisition process in order to turn that memory into an image. Now, from that, we have multiple extraction routines that we use to extract details, kind of just different raw data from the system to, can, to like, move further into our analysis. Now, in our analysis, if you look at the raw data from the previous slide, when we're like, hey, there's a lot of just details that are out there, we should be able to condense this into specific areas. That's what we're doing here. So we have our raw data, we have our aggregation routines, and then we can see that most of this data is either aligned into some sort of uh, process, some sort of file, a module like a DLL or a driver, a network activity, and then a cache. So a cache is you know, what has existed, what is open, like your file table, um, your um, prefetch, those are kind of caches that we can also analyze to see what occurred onto the system. So here is what one of the plugin aggregation routines looks like. It, no kidding, takes all of these. In fact, I ran out of room, but I was like, all right, this is big enough. Um, but there are multiple plugins that all execute in order to go into stating, like, hey, here's the information that we have about a process. And so properly understanding how do you analyze these, I can just make this more easier to interpret what's going on um, on the, the system under analysis. The same thing for modules and drivers. Uh, there are multiple plugins that work with those, as well as this data cross-reference. And we'll go into an example of what do I mean by a data cross-reference. The data cross-reference allows us to see that, OK, how does like a, an artifact or a detail that we want to search, how does that relate to processes? How does it relate to a module? So I don't just want to do a control F or search through different files, and now I get like details or I get hits that are not related to another process. So I still have to do additional investigation. Um, the whole purpose of the cross-reference is to bring that information to you, whatever you're looking for, so now you can make more decisions even faster. All right, now let's, let's, let's get into a, a couple of demos to see um, how, do we, how do we get this to work. And again, live demo gremlin, if anything fails, I'll do my best to, uh, to recover. OK. All right, so um, this is kind of the, the beginning of it. I'm not online. Um, I don't know if this is kind of small. Um, well, the, the actual tool itself will get larger. I would try and mess with the, the image, but then that's, I'm sure something will break at that point. Uh, but anyway, if you go to GitHub, so I have a GitHub, like if you Google Xavier memory analysis, GitHub or Solomon Sonia GitHub, you'll um, go right straight to this tool. So that's where you, download, you can download the tool, like constantly make updates. And so anything that you want, if there's even a new feature that I have not uh, implemented yet, just send me a message and I'll be able to implement that and then you'll see it again um, go live on GitHub. So the first thing um, to understand is how do we configure our machine in order to make the tool work. Um, I have a imports folder and so as soon as the tool runs, it actually configures these folders for you. Um, but you have a few things that you can drop, and then everything else is going to be as efficient as possible. The first one is memory analysis. Like, this is um, you know, pretty basic. What memory analysis tool do we want to use on this? Now, right now, the Xavier framework, as I've written it, it's um, most compatible with a Windows operating system on Volatility 2.6, because that's the last one. And then once you see Xavier 3.0 and, and on, then it will be fully compatible with Windows and uh, Unix operating systems. I kind of felt like I wanted this to be compatible on both in case you are on any system during your investigation. But I chose the hardest one first, which is a Windows system to develop on. Um, but once this is uh, complete, which most of it is, then you'll soon see the update for, um, for Unix side. Right, so that's where we would put our uh, executable, our volatility executable here. It's just going to be inside the memory analysis folder. Then the memory image. So this is where we'll drop the image that we want to execute or conduct our analysis on. And so here, we're just doing that on um, memory dump, and we're using version 1, memory dump 1. Uh, there's also a setup file. So this, this config file, um, this allows you to put comments inside as well as kind of speed up every plugin or executable that you run on the tool itself. So the three important things to add, and then this will be 
appended to every one of your outputs automatically. Um, first one, investigator name, like, you know, what's the name that you have, that, you know, what's your name? Uh, investigation description, so you can put in other comments or details about this, so it, it will continue every time you run this tool. And then the profile. And so this is the specific profile that, um, that is used on the operating system that we're, we're analyzing. Um, there are ways to also use auto run. Like, um, let's say if you always like to execute, you know, uh, processes, look at sockets, net scan, um, dump the master file table. If you, if you like any of these specific types of um, plugins to run every single time you run the tool, um, you can simply just uncomment out any one of these lines that's a plugin here. And as soon as the tool uh, starts, it configures itself, and then it'll, it will auto run the plugins that you desire until it's, it's complete. OK, so let's, let's get the, um, oh, yeah, and so the last one. The last one are additional packages. Um, so with this being a framework, it can be compatible to run with other packages. And so this is mainly on Windows. Windows needs a, a few individual packages to help it. Um, once it's on Unix side, you won't, you won't need to configure any of these, because it will do all of that um, for you. Um, but one is the dependencies. That's just a, a dependency tool um, that allows us to see what are the import commands that went into a process. I really like looking at the import address table, especially when I'm doing malware analysis because this is sometimes how you can see if hooking or injection has occurred just by analyzing the, um, the imports. So that's, that's why it's, it's present for us in our analysis. Uh, there's also GraphViz. I will show you what the output of the GraphViz is for. And then Whois, it conducts Whois, uh, reverse Whois lookups for you in case that's interesting. And Strings, that one is, I'm pr I don't know if I'm going to make that compatible on Windows. It will definitely be compatible on the Unix side. All right, enough of that. Let's um, execute the tool. So uh, the first thing, you know, you, you double-click you double the tool, um, and then it will, it will start to establish this environment. And so it gives you notes, hey, uh, it's looking for stuff. It's checking the tool that you've given it to see what plugins are available. And then it provides all of those plugins to you um, at the top side. All right, so if I expand, this, this kind of uh, what we're looking at. Um, on the front first side here, plugins, um, this is telling like any specific plugin that you would like to run or execute. You can type it or um, select it here. And then you can click Analyze. And as soon as you do that, it will continue running some plugins at the bottom. Um, so that's kind of like the, the, the old stuff that, that you could see before in the plugin side. Now, the good stuff is here in the Advanced Analysis tab. So the Advanced Analysis tab, this lets, it runs almost every um, plugin, and then it does that aggregation for you. Then when it's done, we get an output. So I'm not going to hit, uh, I'm not going to like, run a tool now, because it's, it's going to take a lot of my um, process power, but this is all you would do. Um, as soon as you have your memory image, you have the Xavier tool, and then you can come here and hit um, initialize or in, in, instantiate advanced analysis. And then you'll see lots of text in the middle saying exactly what it's doing. Um, now, what I have done, let's just say, let's, let's fast forward. Let's say you've just clicked this. Um, it will give you output. Like at the top, it will tell you how many plugins is still running, what it's doing, what it's thinking. It takes a while. On my machine, a, like a four gig image takes about 30 minutes for it to analyze. Um, but then once it's done, you will have an output folder like this one. So whatever you've named it, like, uh, I don't know if this will be any bigger, large. All right. I'm not sure if that's any better, but anyway. Um, so as soon as you, you finish, when it's done with this analysis, as I said, it runs all the plugins. And inside each of the folder, that's the result of each plugin that it runs. And you know, if, if, especially if you've done volatility before, if I just click on, let's say, OK, no. Let's just do this one, I, like the, the MFT parser for one. So I'm looking at the master file table. And now at the top, whenever you, at the previous config file, like you saw different things that you put in. You put in your name, investigation description, and then the profile. All of that goes into every output um, file that it appends this information at the top. And so it will give you details like the binary that was used to run, run the tool, the location where it was run from, um, the, yeah, the actual tool itself, hashes, et cetera. So you know that you're always looking at the right, um, at the right image. And then you'll get like a plugin description, what is the description of the plugin that you have, as well as the path again where that command was executed. And then at the bottom, you, know, you have all of your text as before. Um, but in our side, we're like, that's, that's a lot of text. It's not easy to sift through that. That's why when it's complete, this is the, the actual file to care about. And so in this file, it has an HTML um, file that is created. So if I 
open the HTML file, these are all of the details from before that's now brought into a um, kind of like a web page format that we can see. So the details are at the top once again. Um, now, if I click on the process tree, for instance, or if I expand these, I'll expand them and then I'll, I'll talk about it. Right. Um, so the first one, uh, this is like a, a basic process tree. And so I like to know not just what process does what, but like which process called the other process. So that's why this interface is created, and then it, it gets more uh, in-depth as we move along. Um, every one of these um, panes here that you have, if you want it to be larger, um, you can always click on the bottom side here, and it, it will pivot you directly into that same um, file that we saw before. There's a, a um, this is the graph viz plugin that I spoke about previously. And so the graph is would help you like, just automatically create um, what does the, and a, a basic process call tree look like. And so if you've worked with graph is before, um, this is just you know, um, what's present on the system. So uh, it's just helpful in case this, that's what you like to, to work on. And so uh, this one is process. OK, and so here, this is like the specific processes that existed on the computer system. So now instead of having to go through four or five different processes, we can just come here and look at it at one spot. Um, but uh, this is the system area. So here in system tree, this kind of gives you all the other information from processes, but you know, all together on one side. Um, so I want to um, pivot to that in a larger view. So if I just open that in a different tab, um, once, it, once it's complete, now, if I can like, dive down into any one of the processes that we saw before, and if we, if we recall, on this, uh, for this example, it said you know, our colleague sister, um, she saw like, WinRAR was on the machine. She never installed WinRAR. Um, so what, you know, what are the details about that WinRAR? Like, what are the details about the process? What can we learn about that? What versions exist, et cetera? You can now just come here in one spot, and then hopefully that output um, would show up properly. And so um, you know, I've, I've already gone through this before, and also just be for the interest of time. Um, one of the things that we're looking for is going to be uh, WinRAR. That's one, one of the malicious programs here. And so if we search, we can find it. It's right here, WinRAR. And now if I expand. Yeah, so if I can, ex I can expand each of these details to um, kind of determine all of the information about that process, I as I said, just in one spot. Um, that's why this was created, kind of to you know, save our time during the analysis. And so something here, if we look at the process information, um, you know, all of this is in different plugins. It's just aggregated here for us. Um, but I am already keying in on command line. And so I see that this tool had a command line reference. And then a command line reference, uh, this is the user that was there, but also this, this file here, important.rar. And so in this file, important.rar, we will go over that, like, hey, what does this mean? How does this relate to anything else? But at least that's one of the artifacts that if we're doing this analysis, we'll go ahead and write that down. OK, important.rar, let's, let's see what else we can, um, we can find out about that, um, about that process. Uh, there are many other things that we can look at um, myself. Uh, as I said, I, re I really like in the reverse engineering process, I care of the DLLs that are required for this specific process itself, and then the import functions. And so with the import functions, um, here is a good way of seeing perhaps one of the functions might have been um, uh, injected or changed. You can do a snapshot analysis. I'll show how to do the snapshot analysis in a few moments. And so it just lets you dive down deeper to see, like, OK, what could have been changed by a malicious process or so. All right, enough of this one, or we, we may come back to it. Um, if we go back into the tool real quick. Uh, ah, OK, um, here's a way that we can actually reload the entire, um, like the entire analysis if we've done it before. Um, there are two types of imports that we can perform. So here's one so I can interact with the, with the tool. And so if I go to File Import and then Analysis Directory, this allows you to like, reload an entire analysis that you've done before, so you don't have to spend, again, all the time doing all those um, plugins. You can just reload it at once and then have the system restored um, as if it just con concluded the analysis. So what I'll do, I did my um, imports, like load a, a previous directory. And so if I click on the directory that was completed before, um, I'll, I'll do like open, and then it, it reads um, all the details. And so you know, just text, but the text that you see is exactly what you would have seen as it's doing the analysis previously. But more details are, uh, will show up for you now. Um, so um, once the analysis is complete, like these additional tabs um, show if there's additional details that you, as the analyst, need to spend some time looking at. One of them is NetStat. Another would be uh, the user assist um, entries. 
and then your console output. So if I talk about these just for a quick second, um, the net stat, I do want to know like, which connections are present, especially if, if I can find an indicator of compromise. Um, the next one, user assist entries. So these ones are created in a tab um, format. Oops. Sorry, I probably typed something. Excel. And so what you can do, um, you can copy and paste those details here. And then in any other form or so, you, if I zoom in, in any other form or so, you can like, you know, add in filters or such. But what I like to do, especially if I'm doing a capture the flag challenge, I want to see like, what did like, the, the creator of the challenge or you know, how much time did people spend on certain tools or on certain processes. This gives you an idea of, of like, what might be most important or what do you want to focus on first. So um, here, just real quick, if I go back um, this side, I can add a filter as well as do a custom sort. And so if I do a custom sort and I sort on time focused, if I come over here, oops, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, I did that wrong. So give me one second. Sort. Custom sort. Yeah, if I do the custom sort from Z to A. Um, so this is now where I'm looking at what took the most amount of time onto the least amount of time. Um, if you look on like a real lived-in system, um, this is kind of like more ideas of what was running, like what's more, more important to the user. Perhaps which other executables do you need to focus on first as you're doing this type of challenge? And so here we see you know, ex uh, Explorer was running, but we have details of Calculator um, that you know, was, was up for some time, as well as uh, MS Paint. Um, that's one of those. If I scroll down, each one of these is something that we could look at. Um, but um, there's a hit here for like dump it. Um, you know, it's one of our tools that could be utilized to acquire a memory. So that one we'll already eliminate as, all right, we know this one uh, relates to us. But other things that are also present, like command.exe. So now I want to look at consoles, like what's present in the consoles or so. Maybe we can find a key uh, present, as well as Notepad. So Notepad was running. This could be interesting. An investigation, another command of exe, WinRAR, you know, and, it, and it goes down from there. Um, but at least you know, this is just one fast way of seeing if we don't know like, what's actually there, then what should we focus on first? This is one way of, of doing that. Okay. Now, if we look at um, console output, so as this does the analysis, it will automatically come and tell you that, hey, there is console output that you need to look at. And so just here, if I click on Export Data, I think it should export. I'm just going to put a location. Uh, I'll just call it export1.txt. OK, so when that's done, I can kind of further look into, OK, like, what happened in the consoles and the command line output. And then we're just reading to figure out like, what's important or, or useful details to us. So here, we see dump it um, was executed. We have a path that it was executed from. We may likely also um, be able to dump that actual tool directly from memory, and that's what we desired. And then we see the console output. And so that's uh, all these details right here. Um, just a quick note on the console output. I love looking at the console output, like what actually existed or, or what was seen at the time. It, it reminds me of, uh, it's, it's an uh, older movie, um, but uh, anyone seen Wild Wild West with like uh, Will Smith and you know, the other guy? I forgot. A anyone seen that movie, per uh, perhaps? Okay, so at least one person has seen. So uh, you know, it's it's an older movie, but there was there was like a an interesting thing in that movie, in which uh, one of the concepts they were getting at was there is an individual like right at the time that your a, a person dies, like a person is going to die, the last thing that they see is etched into their eyeball, and so I know it's more of it, but uh, at least in the movie they like find a person. I um, you know, like scrape his eyeball and now look, and then they could see the last thing that that person saw. And so for me, like that, that moment always comes whenever I'm looking at consoles, like the console and command line, because we may be able to see exactly what the user or the tool saw at the same time, even though it could be uh, you know, many, many minutes, hours later. And so that's, that's one of the outputs that the, the user actually saw this when this tool was executing. So that's one of the outputs. Um, nothing significant there. If I do another one, this is another output that was provided um, to us. So I'm just going to say console2.txt. So now in this console here, um, we can see again con host, uh, other details. OK, but here's another indicator that already comes out to us right, right, right at this spot. And so if we look at it, we see that the title here 
uh, Windows System32, command.exe, and then there are some details, like this ST4G3 dollar sign one. It's like, I, I don't know what that means, but that's another indicator that we definitely want to write down and do um, further research on. Then if we scroll further down, you know, back to our wild, wild west moment, we can see what the user saw. And so at the C smart net, um, this tool that was executed, we now have this type of prompt here that is provided. And so in this example, this is one of the keys that was present, but at least just being able to immediately pivot into the consoles, this gives us an idea of, of uh, what was present. Now, from uh, what we have so far, we have uh, important that RAR is a, is a useful file to go after, as well as that ST4G3 um, and dollar sign one. And so this is what brings us into the data cross-reference. So on this tool, like the data cross-reference, it allows you to, again, search for an artifact or an indicator, and then we will be able to see how that indicator relates to the other, art the other artifacts in the entire um, image. So all we have to do. Let's come over here to um, search string. And then uh, the, one of the ones we wanted to search was uh, important. So we know that was important.rar. So I can just type in important.rar. And so it will, uh, it will search like through the, the different aspects. Uh, I know I can make this larger. Let me make this larger real quick. That's good enough. OK, um, so at least what we're, what we're finding if, if we go to the very bottom, this was our search string, important.rar. Um, but looking at the text data that's being provided, we can see that there was a process, 1512, winrar.exe. And then this was the, you know, the, the path of the tool. This was also the path of the file that was fed into the tool um, uh, on its own. So that's, that's great to know. As well as, uh, yeah. So th this is a really good um, indicator here. So if we see file scan. So if we have a, an image that says file scan, this means we can immediately dump the file because it was found on the system. And so this is one, um, one artifact we'll come back and dump immediately. Others would provide from the MFT parser, that plugin, um, we can see like its creation time, its access time, as well as other details, sorry, as well as other details about that specific file. So it's just good to know like, hey, these are time frames. Now what else would I do? Um, as soon as I have like, some times of when something was executed, well, I will take that. I, will, I can now look at something like the timeline or so. And then I'll go to that time that we found, look a little bit ahead of that to see like, what occurred on the system. What was the line by line? What were the steps that happened whenever something was being executed? The same thing here, DLL list, command line. Uh, we already went through those details. And then these are the different files that were found with those details provided. But something else that this tool um, would provide is if there is a file, especially if it's in file scan, so if there is a file that we do want to dump, we can immediately click on that and then say, hey, dump the file. And so there are two things that would be found for us. Um, this is saying mem dump. So I can dump the process memory for, from that image. Um, I can also dump the actual files that um, we discovered. So if I do that, all you have to do is just click on it um, here on file scan or so, and then dump selected files. And as the tool is running, um, you'll see here at the top that there's, uh, there's a tool running or a plugin. You know, if you hover over it, it's, it's present. It'll show you like, what, what it's doing until it's, it's complete. When it's done, you usually get an output, or you know, there's nothing at the top saying something's executed. Um, but if I open the directory, and then if I go into um, so that one was dump, uh, dump. Oh, yeah, there it is. Um, so if we go into dumped files, Whatever we said to dump before is already put there for us now. And so now we have the important.rar file. Um, we can rename this, and then we can do like, additional investigation on that file uh, as we desire. Um, so that's one. And then let me just do another quick search on the other one, and then we'll, we'll um, continue on. So the other uh, indicator that we saw was that STG3 dollar sign one. And so uh, this was something that was run from the command line. And now if we look at it again, uh, we can see the, this process, conhost. Um, this was the title from command.exe that was run. We have different paths that already we can find and, and investigate further as we need. Oh, sorry. My fault. Let me make this larger again. Right. OK, so we have um, MFT entries that you can copy and paste this into like an Excel, and your tabs will be set up for you. Um, stage, once again, 
different attributes that were found. But if I go to the right side, I also have this that can be um, dumped from the system. So if I click on that once more, I'll say dump selected file. I'll wait till the um, execution is complete. It usually doesn't take too long. Right. Now if I go back into our dumped file, we have this one um, that was dumped, stage or so dot BAT. Um, so I know that that was the previous file name. So here, if I uh, just add a, it was a, a, it was a dot bat file, right? Or txt. Batch file or txt, if I add a txt extension to it, um, we can actually open that file. And then you know, it just makes it much easier to immediately grab files and artifacts that we're searching for um, from, the, from the system. Right. OK, let me move on real quick into a few um, another points, and then we'll be good. All right, now the last thing. So if we can see that we can analyze the system, we can dump different files, we can also create a system manifest upon, about the image. So the system manifest is a, it's like a, a single file that will distill multiple gigs of an image that you are analyzing into a, a few megabyte-sized file. So what, what I mean by that, this image here, the memlabs, I can't remember how large it was, but let's say it was two gigs or four gigs. In case I want to do analysis on this again, I have to run this every single time you know, in the old way. But now from our uh, analysis here, if we, I, I, I'm, I'm rounding up. Okay. OK. Manifest. Right. Um, so in here, if we go into the manifest um, file, this, this, is the, this is what the system looks like. And so it's not really meant for the user to um, sift through. Like, it's just meant to be ingested into another program. And so if you have something that you use for like elk stack or um, log stash or so, if you want to ingest these into already delineated values, all the values, you can import this um, system file um, to do that. But what we care um, from that system file is again, instead of having to do like even carry a multiple gigabyte directory, if we just go to the file import system manifest, then I can reload the entire system. And so this one was four gigs. Now this, this manifest is only 16 megabytes. You know, that's, that's transferable to help automate our process and make it much easier. But something even better occurs from the system manifest. And I think that'll be the last point, and then we'll take, we'll take a few questions. OK, um, so from here, again, we have our stack. Just as we saw before, our data conversion is going upwards. We start with that memory image, extraction routines. We have different data that's being dumped from those plugins. Then we aggregate those into the different um, attributes that you see on the, the HTML file. But now, once we can put that into a system manifest, this allows us to do even something that's even more precise, which is how do you determine a baseline or a snapshot of the system? For instance, if you know, I go back to the, like the malware analysis step. And so if I'm analyzing a malicious sample, I execute that uh, malicious sample on my virtual machine, or however I do that, I also should have an, a thought of what's occurring in memory. Because if that malware is more advanced, I might, be, I might miss what it's doing on the operating system. However, if we know what the previous snapshot of the memory looked like and the after, then we can determine like, immediately what has changed, what are our import attributes that are inside, inside the program. So that's why the system manifest was created. Okay. All right, so what I will do just real quick, let me go. OK, I think I worked in this one. Let me do this. All right, this will be really fast, and then, you know, I'll take questions if you have any. And so here, this is how you would load the system manifest. And, and at least your use case is the following. I have an image that I want to analyze or so, or I have a system that I want to infect with the malware. Now let's see what occurs in memory. So you have the base image. Before anything has been executed on that, on that uh, system, you take a uh, memory dump of that, and then you run the automated analysis to output that manifest file. So that's the first thing. Then you infect the machine with whatever malware occurs, or you know, anything that, is, that has happened later on, you now check it with our previous known um, system manifest, and then we want to see like, what are the changes or the differences. So here to do that, if we go to advanced analysis, snapshot analysis, and then just initiate snapshot analysis. So that's as basic as it is. Um, initiate snapshot analysis. Then we can point to which image we want to analyze. 
And so I, I just like, made a, something really, really small and quick um, right before coming on the stage. And so what this one is stating is that like, this is our manifest before the system was compromised with malware. So we did our advanced analysis, and then we, we just copy that manifest file. And so we'll say um, open. And then it tells us, please select the manifest of the second file. And so this will be the file after the system has been compromised or so. Uh, so I will go back here, and then I'll go into the manifest file, and I'll just select the second manifest. So it's like your before and your after. And then once it's done, it will begin analyzing this. Um, it will say what it's discovered. And then you get output. So right now, the output is in text. Um, the next update, or one of the next updates you'll see, um, the output will be back into the file browser um, that we saw previously. Um, but here, let me export this real quick. And snapshot. OK. And if I just say like the snapshot, that's um, details of what it was doing. Um, but scrolling down, it will now like, tell us that, again, this is text, um, but it will tell us that, hey, an additional process was detected from before something was executed. Um, additional um, handles or such was, was found. Now, if, uh, think of this as, this is basic, um, think of this as if I did infect this with malware or um, if we've done hacking before, which many of us have, if you go ahead and use like your Metasploit or Meterpreter, you uh, infect a machine, our MS068, as uh, uh, Mr. Jason uh, E Street mentioned. So if you infect that, I also like to know, like, what does the memory actually look like for that infection? How do you see that meterpreter that has moved from one initial process to the other, whose memory is changing? That's exactly what this system manifest is able to provide for you. So now you can see what does memory look like upon those infections, and then this can just better help us as we do further investigations of our systems. OK. Um, that's, that's the last um, initial demo, just one more thing to show you, and then, and then I am complete. Um, there are two things that we'll, you will find in the manifest file, in the manifest folder. So one is the main manifest, and then the other is timeline. And uh, if you, so again, I know it looks nasty here, but you know, this is so you can copy and ingest this into another um, log analysis tool or even put this onto Excel. Um, but all of the files and details that you can find, similar to Super Timeline that you might have utilized in Volatility, um, but the, my issue with Super Timeline is it actually leaves off details. And so this timeline um, brings like, all of the details together, your shell bags, your shim cache, everything is kind of aligned in the same format. So this makes it easier to truly determine what is the timeline whenever an, an, uh, an infection or um, something occurred on the system. This helps you better see that. Um, so that's why these, these images and in, in, um, system files uh, were created. OK, um, so that is, I think, yeah, that's going to be most of what we'll, um, what we'll cover in this demo. So um, I'd like to stop here if, oops, how did, how did I go back? Um, let me stop here. And if there are any questions, I'll take those. I also do want to state that um, if there are specific use cases to your environment, if there's anything that you need specifically, hey, I'm glad you can do this output. Can we convert it into another format? Like, that's, that's easy now, um, because this takes all the information. And if there's anything that you need, just let me know, because uh, it's an open source tool. It is free. Um, there's nothing I'm charging for that. So I just want it to be more useful as we do any type of memory investigation or analysis or conduct those challenges um, later on in the future. OK, that's all I have. I don't know if there's any time for questions. I will do. Uh, <laughs> Thank first. you. Thanks, Solomon, Sonia. Thank you very much. That was, uh, wow, OMG, very, very, very deeply technical. Thank you. Uh, someone want to oh, ask yeah. a question? Yeah. So I will let. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, yes, and uh, awesome tool. Uh, my question is, uh, can we say that volatility, uh, volatility is dead? Oh, oh, are you saying because of my tool, can we say volatility is dead? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, 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 okay. Is your tool killed uh, volatility? So, one more time. Is there a new tool like which one? Um, I, I mean, uh, your tool is very uh, interesting, very um, in, it has a lot of, uh, yeah, of tools of uh, interesting things. Um, I mean, is this tool better than volatility? Oh, I see. 
Right. OK, I, I definitely understand. So um, as you're asking, is this tool like better than the volatility yeah. um, type of tool? And I, I would actually say like, like definitely not, because it, um, like it, right now it rides on top of volatility. So I actually just use all the plugins from volatility to condense that into a better output so it's easier for uh, anybody doing that investigation to just see like, what exists out there. Yeah, so it's, it's not, this not yet, it's not meant to be a replacement, just you know, how do we better understand uh, what, what, what the output is giving us from volatility. Was that similar to what you? Yeah. Thanks. Hello. Hey. OK. Uh, I have a question about uh, Unix. Mm -hmm. Will you update your tools to oh, yes. have Unix profile uh, in count? Correct. Uh, absolutely. And so you know, as a question, you know, if, will I update this tool to incorporate Unix and the plugins and have that information? Absolutely. Like, that is the next version that's coming out. You know? And so as soon as you see Xavier 3.0, above 3, um, that's the Unix update that will finally be incorporated. Yeah, I'm just working on, I, I chose the hardest one first, which is actually a Unix system for this type of, an, uh, I'm sorry, Windows system for this type of analysis. You know, I just wanted it to be cross-compatible. But once I'm just about done, then Unix comes out very quickly. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey. hey. Thank, Thank you, you so for much your for talk. A, uh, for talk. Quick question oh, on no. uh, a Unix version. Oh, hey, just oh okay, sorry, up, up here. Okay, uh, okay, then we'll come to you, we'll come to you second. Okay, okay. sorry, sorry about that. Okay, up, up here. I have two quick questions. Uh, which issues do you plan to have on the Unix version? As uh, I think it's, your tool, your developer your tool with Java. Mm -hmm. So which issues do you plan when you have uh, a Unix version? And uh, is there a text version of the old GUI if we want to just to grab something and have all the information related to, for example, a process, see uh, all the command line and all the stuff just aggregate together. Uh, yeah. So I think I, I understand. So one, you, you asked, is there, is there like a text version of like all of the data, for instance, like process and such? And um, if I go back, this might be what you're asking. Um, so this is tables. If I go into the tables itself, um, sorry, I, I didn't even show this one, but um, this is like all the, all the details about the process that's put here that was discovered, including MD5 hashes. And I'm not online, um, but if you click on this, it should also like link you to virus total um, in case uh, that um, file was found to be malicious or so. And then you can just move further to the right, like command line, other details um, that was found. I, I try and incorporate that um, towards this side so it's you know, textual as well as the graphical stuff that we had above. Did that answer? At least I think that was your second one. And then the first one, I, I believe you're asking, will, it, when, will this be compatible on Unix side? Like, uh, was it like, what language will I write it in? Or, um, yeah, yeah, so um, at least the first one will, will still be on the base Java. And if, and if that one is received well, then I'll write it in Python. Um, it's just developing takes time. Um, but whoever desires it, like if, if you tell me that it's really needed in Python, then I'll move over and write it in Python. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. question. Thank you, Simon, for the talk. No problem. Uh, just one note. So uh, here we had a time to cover an example where something happened to mm -hmm. a computer, and we get to look at the memory dump, and mm -hmm. we had the time to look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about the uh, scalability and the sustainability of a memory forensics for larger organization, uh, data providers, cloud providers, where mm -hmm. the prerogative when things goes down mm -hmm. is not necessary to investigate what happened to it, but just to know hey, can you get that, get that server back up as fast as possible so we mm -hmm. can lose as less money as possible? Right. Um, so uh, definitely for cloud, like, um, I currently don't have a plan um, to implement like in, in making the, like a cloud system even faster or so to investigate as long as if we can grab a dump of that. Uh, so this is what I would do. Um, if I did have like a cloud infrastructure or machines that I need, if I know something like is not working right, I will go back to my, like, my backup process. I'll bring the backup running now. I'll still take an image of that, and then I'll launch it into like a more beefier system that can still run these tools. Because uh, if we do want to do analysis on it, like, there is no browser you know, for memory. Um, there's no easy browser for that, but uh, I'll still go back into this and just wait until the analysis is done, and then I'll come back and read the results. That, but that's kind of how I would, I would look at it so far. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if that fully answered you know, what you're looking for. Kind of. Yeah. Right. Anything else? Oh, OK, yes, over here. Hi. Hey. Uh, first, so thank you very much for, for your presentation. It was very fascinating. I'm not quite familiar with uh, forensic and live forensics, mm -hmm. but uh, it was very uh, 
interesting. And uh, I have uh, one curious question. It is, uh, how would you d describe the design process of such a tool? Because I feel like uh, it has so much added value to the process you follow during uh, forensics that uh, in the design of this tool, there must have been some like golden nuggets to, to be aware us as a cyber security mm. uh, engineer to mm. implement such good tools. Right. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, thank you for that. I, I think if I'm understanding right, like you, there are different design processes that I did put in, you know, to the tool, and I, I did start with like hypotheses first. Like, is it possible? Can we? Can we? Is it a way that um, I don't have to go through 10 different plugins, you know, really to look at just one process itself? So uh, at least with that start, is like, okay, what all do I need to execute? You know, so I actually ran every single one of the plugins, and you just look at it for a while to see, okay, what are the similarities? And then, you know, I code that into the project, and then I look for the next one. What are the similarities? I'll code that into the project. Then I'll see, oh, some things are missing. Um, kind of like um, we went over with the command line or the output. It's like, hey, that's, that's a missing process. I think that will be useful to investigators because I think of what's useful to me as the investigator. So that's when I'll put that um, back in. I usually try like what is most important. Whenever you com you're finished with the advanced analysis, those tabs that appear, I think like, that's what I, I hope you know, the user should like, look at first. And then from that, you pivot straight into the cross-referencing to see how do those artifacts reference like, in the entire system. And then hopefully that can help us you know, um, get things along. Yeah, and I think the last one would be that timeline. So it was a lot of data I put up there, but that timeline, in my opinion, um, as soon as I know something did occur, I sort all the, of the entries by that timeline, and then I go like a little bit before that, and I start going down line by line to figure out like what actually happened. I think that that was just you know the, the process that I had um, I had here. So, mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, I probably need a, any anything else. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks again. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>